This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. We're in a world right now where people are terrified about what you might call the resilience or the evolution of democracy, our ability to meet collective challenges like climate change, our concerns about overcoming the hideousness of racism and gender discrimination. And in that context, in all the tension, people are very, very concerned about expertise, education, and cr the credibility. Are these people who are well-educated doing marketing for power, or are they there to represent a deeper understanding of the public good? Obviously, we all look for the latter. And today I have with me a gentleman who's very experienced in this realm and very devoted. Ronald J. Daniels, the president of Johns Hopkins University, has written a new book called What Universities Owe Democracy. I think this is, how would I say, what the doctor ordered is someone with his level of experience and insight sharing with us how to, which you might call, turn the super tanker of education so that we miss the coral reef and have a successful voyage. Ron, thanks for joining me. Uh, so great to be here, Rob. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this book, which I believe you have two co-authors, Grant Shreve and Philip Spector, who are involved with you, and you can describe the chemistry that you put together. But this book, as you could tell from my introduction, just feels like what you might call what the doctor, what the spirit doctor ordered. And I'm curious, where did the inspiration come from? Where did, what inspired you to do this book and now? So I think it starts first and foremost uh, with the sense that I and so many of us have around the state of our democracy and the concerns about the uh, fragility of our democracy in the face of growing polarization, distrust in core institutions, uh, the um, rise of fake facts, um, the tendency for people to not merely think that uh, those with different views are wrong, but they're immoral or evil. And in all of these ways, I think this creates a very perilous moment for democracy. And um, it's in that context that um, given my many decades as a student, as a faculty member, as a dean and now uh, president of a university, I've been thinking lots about uh, the role that universities play in supporting democracy. And it, uh, the more I thought about this, the more um, it seemed to me that universities are not just an institution in society, but perhaps are an indispensable institution for the flourishing of uh, democracy. And in a way that these institutions have a role to play that is comparable to the role that we see at an independent judiciary, responsible elected legislatures, um, uh, a free press uh, playing in our democracy. And uh, if that is true, then it's important to understand the precise ways in which universities foster democracy. And then of course, to ask the question, as much as we think as we uh, think and know that we are doing to support democracy, to ask the question, are we doing enough? And if we're not, what should the reform agenda look like? And so it's really that fundamental sense of the marriage of the seriousness of this moment, coupled with the perspective power of this institution to do more to respond to it. Mm -hmm. well, I, uh, from our preliminary discussion preparing for this, I came to understand that you grew up in Canada and uh, the great author Jane Jacobs, her last book in 2004 was called Dark Age Ahead. The third chapter was called Credentializing versus Educating. And I guess where I would break it down if I were trying to be simple for the audience is are you being taught to be an input to production or are you being taught to be a citizen or both in, in both matter? And it seems to me that the, what you might call the withering of the democratic, the citizenship flank 
has taken place. I know in the United States, when I was a boy in Detroit metropolitan area, we took civics. And it was about the role and the favorable role of what government institutions did to create the contours and enforce the contours of a just society. But that seems to have evaporated, and along with it, some of the trust and faith and confidence in government institutions. And I don't know that that cynicism is always unwarranted, but if there's a better way, we've got to be able to teach that. And it seems to me that's what you're invigorating is that possibility at this critical time. Absolutely. And so, you know, I think it starts first and foremost with, you know, a sense of what is the responsibility, not just for universities, but for K-12 education in terms of educating our uh, children for the responsibilities of democracy. And as our founders well understood, Democracy is not easy. It's challenging. It's mm -hmm. challenging when there is not a central dogma or a central truth. It is challenging to have to deal with uh, competing viewpoints, competing claims um, around what the public good requires. Um, and, and so it's in that early, early world that we know that we have to equip um, our children with the capacity as they mature into adulthood and to take on the responsibilities of citizenship, that they understand the nature of the enterprise that we're involved in, why uh, we have the institutions we do in the United States, where uh, those institutions have worked well, where they have not, how they have evolved to respond to challenges and failures, and you know, more than that, to equip students with the capacity to be able to take that knowledge and to be able to um, develop the skills and habits of uh, working with others across difference to be able to foster change um, in our society. And I, I, I think it's really a foundational responsibility. It's, um, you know, these this sense of understanding of democracy and its requirements doesn't get um, acquired through osmosis. It requires deliberate education. And, um, and uh, to the extent in this country that we know that 25%, only 25% of the students graduating from high school have had a proper grounding in civics, uh, that means that um, uh, that if we're going to rectify that situation, it falls to universities uh, to step up. And again, given that we have a situation where more than 70% of Americans will go into some level of post-secondary education, I think that um, we're important sites for uh, being able to respond to this challenge. And, and, and again, I think it, it doesn't have to come at the cost of giving students expertise, skill, dare I say, credentials in areas where they um, uh, are interested in pursuing uh, um, careers, professions upon graduation. So it's not either or, but we have got to understand that we're both uh, uh, training for the marketplace, but at the same time, uh, educating for citizenship. You've given us a very good statement of what in the meta sense and why, but I guess it's how. How sure. are you, how do you see the specific evolution of university education facilitating your goal? So me, um, maybe it uh, might be helpful if I start first and unpack a little bit the uh, the idea that universities yeah. are indispensable for democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think some people might say, well, uh, you know, I get courts, I get the media, um, universities are good in training, but why do we really think a vital role for universities is indispensable for democracy? Maybe I can, I can talk a little bit about that and then we can talk about perspective reforms. Okay. Good. Um, you know, to start, um, so much of the writing about universities and the extent to which they touch democracy has historically been about the importance of a liberal arts education. And when you look at 
whether um, it's Alan Bloom's uh, classic Closing of the American Mind, a total, totally improbable bestseller that shaped That's lots right. of debate for a time, or it's some of the recent writing of people like uh, Tony Crawman at Yale, it's, uh, the focus has been very much on the importance of getting uh, the Western canon, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the liberal arts, back into the first, it back into uh, the undergraduate curriculum. And that's an important debate to be had, um, but I think it's only part of the story about how universities affect the society of which we're part, not just about what kind of undergraduate, formal undergraduate program you have, but there's so many other ways. And so let me just talk about those briefly. You know, one, universities are really important engines for social mobility. In fact, there's no more powerful uh, instrument for taking people from disadvantage and, and, and casting them up the economic ladder. And it's not just that those who graduate with a university degree are um, going to enjoy a significant increase in lifetime earnings. Um, it's uh, not um, just that they will um, have uh, much less risk of periods of unemployment. It is that they will live longer. Um, we know that they will enjoy greater family stability. Um, there's a greater degree of contentment. Um, so there's so much that uh, happens with the, um, with the receipt of a university education. And um, it's here that um, one can't help but ask the question, given the overwhelming uh, weight of students in universities, both public and private, here in the United States and indeed internationally, to students from the highest income strata, the question is, how well are we doing um, in ensuring that the ideals of equal opportunity and getting access to the benefit of social mobility is being realized? So I think that's an important area where we very directly touch uh, the confidence in democracy. Another area uh, which uh, we play an important role is around um, educating for democracy and teaching uh, the ideals of the Enlightenment and what it is that we're trying to uh, achieve through the structure of government we have in this country and where the aspirations uh, have been of the founders have been properly realized, where they may have been uh, too myopic and we've over time broadened them. Uh, these are important issues for us to be uh, uh, teaching our students and to make sure that they are well prepped for citizenship upon uh, graduation. And it's not just about stock of knowledge. I think there's skills and habits that we can inculcate in our students during this time that will make them better citizens and better equipped to deal with the challenges that we see in democracy today, including, of course, the ability to be able to discern fact from fiction, where there's so much exposure to claims and sometimes people are overwhelmed in terms of being able to know what is true and what is not, which is so foundational to democracy. We want to operate on truth rather than falsity. Um, the other area which I think institutions um, of higher education are absolutely critical is that we're really important places where um, we are dedicated to the pursuit of truth, of uh, creation of knowledge, of, of stewardship of knowledge, and um, as places that take the commitment to fact and truth so seriously, um, we play an important role in helping media and indeed political representatives be, be able to check, confirm, verify what claims are being made out uh, in uh, the marketplace of ideas are true and what are manifestly false. And so we play an important role of checking um, uh, checking claims. And here, you know, it seems to me that um, we um, have to worry a lot about ensuring that our ideas are uh, shared, are accessible, and the public can have a high degree of trust in our reliability. And I think we face some challenges on that front. And then finally, 
Um, and, you know, as important as the other three areas that I've talked about, you know, in a world uh, where increasingly we just don't hold uh, different views and are unwilling to really engage with others across the divide, we actually create lives for ourselves where we live, socialize, um, and work with people who are just like ourselves. So we sedulously avoid the opportunities for contact and engagement. We know this in terms of the great sort in American society of liberals living with liberals and conservatives living, living with conservatives and never the twain shall meet. Universities have become very intentionally um, sites of enormous diversity, of enormous pluralism. Our classes are, are much more diverse by race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, geography than they've ever been. Um, and it seems to me that we've got four years when the students are undergraduates to do something really extraordinary and allowing students to be able to learn how you navigate those differences and find friendship, civic friendship uh, with those whom you might vociferously, intensely disagree with, but nevertheless can still see yourself as being part of a collaborative enterprise. And if we do that right, if we're better to, able to equip students with the ability to negotiate those differences, then I think we've got a shot, particularly given the, the high numbers of uh, young Americans who are in post-secondary of education, um, to, um, to be able to change the arc of, uh, of the country's culture, and in particular, to increase the likelihood that um, we um, uh, become less polarized and less distrustful of each other and the institutions that govern us. Mm -hmm. Well, I think these are very, uh, how I say, very powerful elements of the healing and the repair and the evolution of our society. What are there specific uh, structures that are, in your mind, obstacles to this achievement that you you would like to underscore? You know, um, it's a great question, Robin. I think for me, um, you know, when you think about what what would change if we would take these ideas seriously, you know, I think we would, for instance, uh, end legacy admissions. Um, I mean, this is a this is a practice where, as you know, um, about seventy of the hundred top uh, uh, private universities in the country um, uh, put the thumb on the scale for uh, s students who um, are uh, family members of graduates of the institution. If we're really committed to the ideals of American democracy, Jeffersonian ideals of equal opportunity, it seems to me that it's uh, very difficult to justify such an overt preference for people um, who come from privilege, and particularly when there's so many other benefits that, uh, that, um, that students of, or children rather, of, 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 of graduates uh, of a university will already have by virtue of their parents being educated and subject mm -hmm. to all of the benefits that I talked about before in terms of higher earning power and so forth. So, I, you know, that's something that's clearly available to us just to stop tomorrow. It doesn't require government edict. Um, one could think about, for instance, how we deal about um, um, our uh, challenges around educating uh, for, uh, for democracy. And here I think think a number of institutions are moving in the direction of uh, uh, introducing courses or clusters of courses where students are given the opportunity, in some cases required, to, um, uh, to take um, an exposure to um, some kind of educational training in democracy before graduation. Again, that's easily available to us. And then, you know, if you think about um, other practices within the university that I think have undermined our effectiveness in promoting some of the things I'm talking about. One of the one of the obvious places is around, and it's quite simple. It's around housing. Um, when students mm. come into universities, and again, as I said before, these enormously diverse and interesting communities we're creating. Um, 
But to the extent they are given, for instance, the ability to choose their own roommate before they come to university for the first time, and when they do that, um, that they're choosing you know, roommates in university housing that look a lot like them, you know, whether it's by race or by socioeconomic status, that seems to me to be something that is a lot, you know, that represents a lost opportunity. And here, again, something as simple as what some universities have done recently, which is to end the ability of students to self-select their own uh, college roommates before coming to university, again, is a simple way in which we foster this idea. Mm -hmm. So there's lots mm -hmm. of things, and there's others that I talk about in the book that I think can, that make this uh, um, broad um, ambition very practicable. And, um, and, I, and I don't think that um, much stands in the way of doing this other than our willingness in some sense to, um, uh, to take this uh, responsibility seriously. Yeah. Well, I do think, you know, how, I want to talk about two dimensions of learning. One, the learning is the experience of who you learn with, like you said, the diversity, whether geographic, gender, race, income, uh, you know, tiers that the children come from. And so that, that which you might call fostering of mutual respect across all those different categories is contributing to the democratic sensibility. Absolutely. The other question I, I'm curious about is in the curriculum, a lot of people have written about what I'll call the rise of the vocational, you know, accounting, business majors, and the things of that nature, and the decline of the humanities, poetry, music, Shakespearean literature, and all of that. What role that latter chapter, what evolution of the curriculum do you think is a, we might call a necessary ingredient in achieving this success? So um, in, um, in the book, I, uh, I discuss this briefly in other writing that I've done, I talk about it very explicitly, uh, the importance of the humanities in undergirding a good um, a good undergraduate education, and it, um, and and I've talked about you know the extent to which in a place like Hopkins we have a lot of students who are deeply interested in the sciences, um, and that's an, and and that's why they come to Hopkins. But as I like to remind them that you know one just in terms of the kind of technical skill that you're looking to acquire while you're here. Um, it's going to come at a very early point in your professional lives when you are going to be confronted with issues as to how you think about that technology, how you use it. Um, is, uh, does, it, it does it comport with uh, the public interest? Um, you know, doctors face this on a, on a daily basis. Um, research scientists face this in terms of the new technologies in CRISPR and artificial intelligence and so forth. And you need an understanding that goes beyond the technical aspect of these scientific disciplines to contextualize it. Uh, so I think that's really important just for being good at what you do on graduation. At another level, um, I think just in uh, terms of as you know, we know as we age, we become more and more attentive to the meaning of our lives and whether we're having the impact that uh, we want to have and you know thinking more carefully about uh, whether we're living up to the things that we hold most dearly and again I think that's what an educated imagination that is steeped in the humanities allows you to do and I feel very strongly that you know, as much as we're trying to prepare students for the first job, and I think the humanities are helpful, even if they're a minor to the major in engineering sciences, we also got to think about, you know, the midlife crisis that is, you know, that comes the way of so many of us, and how we actually equip students with the ability to have avoided that by ensuring they're leaving lives that are meaningful to them. But even when that moment, and if that moment still happens, that they have some foundations as to be able to work through it and, uh, and to understand uh, how 
they fit in um, in a broader universe. So I, I, I think we can do all this. It's, it's, not, it's not either or, it's and with. There is a sense, I think, in which uh, we've been talking about enlarging the community within the United States, but enlarging that dialogue and difference and compassion and curiosity across borders may also contribute mightily to the quality of our future children's lives. And, uh, and I, so I, I'm curious how you see those, the, what you might call the cross-cultural challenges to be integrated in this process. You know, Rob, it's a really um, interesting point that you're raising. And, you know, in fact, it's, it's, it was uh, the, the, you know, the challenge that you're raising about how we uh, negotiate an increasingly interconnected global society is one that you know 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I first became uh, the dean of the law school at the University of Toronto, um, I was uh, very focused. We were very focused on this sense of how do we open up to uh, um, the world and what this what what the opening uh, implies for our educational mission in a law school, indeed across the university. And there was a sense, you know, that globalization is going to infect every nook and cranny of life. So just precisely things you're talking about as you know how how we uh, work to understand. Uh, different cultures and societies, and you know how um, how we should assess them, uh, work across them, and so forth. That was all. That was a paramount concern, and it's still, of course, important today. But I think, in some sense, the spotlight has shifted. You know, very much domestically. That um, you know, given how deeply riven we are domestically, if we don't get over the level of polarization, acrimony, and trust, distrust that I think threatens the core stability of mm -hmm. our common enterprise here, it's hard for me to imagine we're going to be worth much on an international stage. Yeah, I agree. And so I think in some sense, the issue that you're raising around uh, global society and how we reflect that in our mission are really important. But we've got a more important issue, given what's going on at home right now, that we have to solve and solve quickly um, if we're going to be able to maintain our uh, end of the conversation at the global level. Yeah. So I think it's just a question now of shifting priorities, not that we that we dismiss this other poll. It's just that we understand the perilous state of our domestic political culture. Yeah, your how do I say your awareness of society, of institutional elements, and of the emotional psychological elements in a person learning is, is I've, I'm just, I delight at listening to you today and the way in which you can integrate all of these things. It feels to me more like a credible healing than almost anything I've read or, or heard in recent times. And what I really, uh, I really admire is that you are embracing this challenge when everybody's scared. It'd be easy to hunker down, but you're becoming an even greater leader by rising to the challenge. And I wanna, I wanna celebrate that for a moment with you with a song that I heard in my mind as I was listening to you. It comes from Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, but Teddy Pendergrass sang it. And the first portion of the, the name of the song is Wake Up Everybody. Wake up everybody, no more sleeping in bed, no more backward thinking, time for thinking ahead. The world has changed so very much from what it used to be, so there's so much hatred, war, and poverty. Wake up all the teachers, time to teach a new way. Maybe then they'll listen to what you have to say, because they're the ones who are coming up and the world is in their hands. When you teach the children, teach them the very best you can. In the chorus, the world won't get no better. If you just let it be, it won't, won't get no better. We got to change it. Yeah, you and me. Well, I got to do my part because you're rising to the challenge. But it's really, uh, I, I feel very fortunate to have been able to spend this time, share it with my audience, my young scholars. We have a, over 15,000 in our Young Scholars Initiative. And... Uh, how would I say? I look forward to them 
reading your book, engaging in discourse, talking about the reform of economics, or affirming parts of economics, but engaging, engaging in that critical discourse. But you're, you're one heck of a catalyst, and you're very insightful. And, I, and I'm grateful that you joined me today. Thanks so much, Rob, for our truly wonderful uh, and uh, really uh, interesting uh, conversation. I've, I've really enjoyed it.